So welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us for Inside the Industry. Uh, this is the first in a series of events we're doing throughout the year uh, to show the inside of the fashion industry. And it's a great partnership that we have with Topshop that enables us to create these events. We're very grateful to Central St. Martin's for hosting us this evening. And we're grateful to all of you for joining us. Um, I want to start by giving short introductions to our illustrious panel. Um, some of them need no introduction. Uh, and I'm also going to ask them to kind of introduce their stories later. So I won't spend too much time. But to my immediate left is Caroline Issa, Chief Executive and Fashion Director of Tank Magazine and Tank Form. She works with clients ranging from... <laughs> yes, please! <laughs> Mulberry, Hugo Boss, and Todd. To her left is Anya Heinmarsh, CBE, designer and founder of her eponymous label, Anya Heinmarsh, renowned for her combination of modern craftsmanship, creativity, and of course, personalization. And <laughs> next to her is Stephanie Fair, Chief Strategy Officer of the fashion platform Farfetch. Uh, where she recently joined to drive long-term strategy and innovation. Uh, Stephanie is also an advisor to Felix Capital and sits on the board of Montclair as an independent non-executive director. <laughs> and last but not least, we have Jenny Cossens, who is head of brand partnerships at the Global Fashion Search Engine List. And she oversees the acquisition and retention of retail partners and is responsible for um, maintaining the overall product offering. So welcome to Jenny as well. <laughs> so why have we chosen these uh, four amazing women to join us this evening? It's because each of them has their own fashion story. And one of the things that we're trying to, to get across is, through these events is that there's actually no single way to break into the fashion industry. And as we were kind of forming and thinking about the panel of people we'd like to have to, to speak with you today, I really wanted to show you that you know everyone has a different fashion story. It's one of the things that I've learned from the very beginning of my time in the fashion industry is that everyone has their own fashion story. So I thought we could start, ladies, by getting to know what your fashion stories were. And maybe we'll start with Caroline and we'll go down the line. Um, but tell us what it was that first drew you to fashion. What was the moment when you know, things clicked mm -hmm. for you and how you ended up in the role that you're in today? Okay, um, so I had always been a, a fashion magazine lover. I used to devour my issues of Vogue and Harper's Bazaar. Um, in my teens, Sassy Magazine, 17, uh, loved them, but uh, it was you know, quite a world away. I ended up getting scouted in Montreal, in Canada, and ended up being a very, very, very terrible model. Um, and I don't <laughs> no, 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 trust me, trust me. Uh, I, after a summer spent in Milan, uh, realizing that um, being on the side where you, know, you were part of a team but not really making any decisions, I was like, this is definitely not for me. So I um, decided to apply to an undergraduate business school in the States, um, which is the Wharton School at Penn and do um, a business degree, essentially. So I graduated um, from the University of Pennsylvania with uh, a bachelor's degree in economics. And I became a management consultant. And luckily, my first ever client was Nordstrom. So I actually got to work. Um, I was the number cruncher as an analyst, obviously. But I got to work in a, an environment that was sort of surrounded by uh, fashion. But then my, my subsequent clients were nowhere near fashion. Um, and after three years, I had been moved to London, actually, and um, <clears throat> was doing corporate strategy work for Boots. And I realized that being in London, but sort of doing that work was not really making me happy. And a mutual friend introduced me to the founder of Tank Magazine, saying there's this great little cool niche magazine. You know, you know business. Their bookkeeper's like an artist. You know, it's a disaster over there. Just go spend some time with them. And I used to spend all my weekends and um, evenings and any time that I actually had free um, <laughs> working with the team and completely falling in love with both the magazine side of the business and 
some other consulting. They were doing a magazine for Levi's. They were art directing campaigns for Jean-Paul Gaultier. It was so interesting. And I made a decision to kind of quit my very stable, well-paying job as a consultant, much to my parents' chagrin, and join them um, as kind of the publisher of Tank, knowing zero <laughs> about the publishing industry. And it's been 15 years and a very interesting, winding career later, but um, it's definitely not your typical fashion starting story, I guess. Okay, thank you, Caroline. And Anya, tell us about your fashion story. <clears throat> well, mine was quite different. Um, I was given <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> less education. <laughs> um, I, uh, I was given a handbag when I was 16, and I knew the moment I was given it how excited I was by the world of craftsmanship and, and leather. And um, so I... I knew that I wanted to start a business and actually start designing. And the two things were interesting to me, not just the designing and not just the business. Um, so I finished my A-levels and I decided to go to Florence, which was the home of leather and, and still is to a certain extent, and um, to really get to know and understand the world. Um, skipped university, there weren't that many offers, truthfully. I was quite impatient in the classroom, <laughs> I think it's fair to say. Uh, would have killed to have come here, mm. actually. I mean, what I would give to have a year here right now. Um, and... Um, <laughs> I started designing handbags and having them made in Florence and bringing them back to London and selling them, literally, by going to visit the, the retailers um, and started getting orders from, from uh, in those days, Joseph, was my first ever uh, customers, and then uh, actually more from the States, Barneys and Bergdorf's, and um, it just really grew and grew as a wholesale business. Um, and from there, I then took the big uh, step to, well, actually, I was approached actually by a Actually, no, we opened a first floor shop, which is all I could afford at the Ooh. time, in Walton Street. And um, that actually then brought lots of customers in. I really got to sort of speak to the customer and actually hear what they wanted, which was super useful. Um, and actually, one of the customers was from Hong Kong and um, asked if, we would, if I would open a store in Hong Kong with her. Bear in mind, I only had a first floor store at this, this point. Um, so at the age of, I don't know, 20-something, we opened a store in Hong Kong. I remember going to visit it the first time. It was covered in bamboo scaffolding. It was really, really exciting. Um, and um, then opened more stores in London and, uh, and then opened my first store in New York. Um, and it just grew and grew and really learned about business and learned about design and with the craftsman and actually learned about uh, a brand. And, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. I mean, a lot of work, for sure. 30 <laughs> years later. How many years? Uh, 30. <laughs> <laughs> uh, doesn't make it. No. <laughs> Sometimes it feels. Um, and, um, and actually about four or five years ago, I was joking to say I fired myself as I was CEO and also the creative <laughs> director, but I actually decided to go back to the creative role full time and actually employed my first CEO. And actually it was really exciting to go back and really sort of just breathe the creativity completely. And, and that's actually been a really nice thing, I think, certainly for me and I think for the business to, to really kind of um, put some new energy back into the, um, the creative side. So that's my story. So it's very busy. Business is growing frantically all over the world. I'm endlessly on a plane, as we all are. Um, but I feel pretty, pretty lucky. So thank you, Anya. Now what's interesting, Stephanie, is that both Caroline and, and Anya have been building businesses and have stayed in the, same, in the same role basically since they kind of discovered the fashion thing. What's interesting about your story is that you have experience in lots of different companies. Yeah. So tell us your fashion story. Mm -hmm. So my fashion story, I fell into fashion. Um, I really, to be truthful, hadn't really dreamed about fashion. Um, in fact, I went to um, Oxford and did a course called PPE, Philosophy, Politics and Economics. And if you did that, really you ended up in a bank or a consultancy at the time. They were called milk rounds, and that was the only choice you had, really. Um, but I thought, well, I'll take a bit of time off. I'll go to New York, um, um, be a waitress or work. Uh, there weren't cool coffee shops at the time, so you couldn't be a barista. Um, but, and then come back to London and sort of go into my career. But then I love New York, and so I thought, I'll take any job that will keep me in New York. So it really was whoever was willing to sponsor me at the time. And I came across this unbelievable, um, very sort of energetic um, woman called Winnie Beatty, who was 23. I thought she was very old and mature at the time, but she had this small PR agency, and they were willing to sponsor my visa. So I sort of landed in a PR agency for lifestyle, and we were tiny and scrappy, and um, we uh, answered our own phones as our assistants. Stephanie Fair's phone. <laughs> yes, let me, uh, let me get her for you. Um, but it was a great way to, to learn the industry. So it was really because I fell into it, and that led to a role at a brand, Isimiyake, 
which was much less about fashion actually and more about design and architecture and I, I, I learned a whole other part of the business um, from the brand side but also how to work with completely different cultures, going to Japan, working with Ise-san. Um, so I would say up to then it was very opportunistic um, and, and I think it's important to sort of remember um, to not be so focused because things come along and you don't expect them. Um, and then when I really, to your question Imran, where I really felt, okay, now I'm in fashion, I hadn't planned this, but now I am, um, was when I got a call, um, still in New York, uh, from Condé Nast, and they had a role um, at Vogue, American Vogue, um, to work on all the um, communications and marketing on the editorial side. So anything to do with basically anything that Anna wanted to do. So it was the Met, it was, we launched the CFDA Vogue Fashion Fund. We did that first movie with the Prenza Schooler Boys. So it was really an exciting time. And then I thought, okay, now I'm really in fashion. And now I really live in New York. Um, <laughs> up to then, it was just sort of one thing led to another. Um, and then from there, um, and so these are the winding roads, um, I could have continued on that track and PR and comms, and, but I decided I wanted to go more onto the business side. Um, and so I got an opportunity through connections and network and talking to people to go to a complete startup in, in e-commerce. Um, mind you, this is 2005. And really, I mean, we weren't allowed to use the word blog um, uh, at work. It was really early. But I thought, well, this will give me an opportunity to learn about business. Well, e-commerce sounds great. I'd love to think I, I totally knew it was the thing. but <laughs> And so that's what got me into digital and e-commerce. And from there, I did that for a, a four years, actually. Moved to London um, and got an amazing break, um, thanks to Natalie Massenet and Mark Seba, the CEO, to launch a business within net So it was this... I don't think it comes very often to have the ability to do a startup within an established business, and that was the outnet. Um, so that's the longest job I've ever had. It was seven years of growing a business from nothing to um, until about a year ago, um, and took a year off after after those seven years. It's a sabbatical for real, um, and ended up at Farfetch. So it's been a bit of a winding road, but um, but yeah. Uh, a fun one. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. And Jenny, um, your story is also multi multiple experiences. <laughs> so tell us about your fashion story. Sure. And I love that you said earlier, Imran, about how there is no one set journey because, um, truth be told, fashion is really kind of my third career in a way. Um, and still counting, I guess. Um, I think ultimately, for me, I originally uh, wanted to be a museum curator. So my very first job was working for a gentleman named Jay Carter Brown, who was the director of the National Gallery of Art in Washington. And I was very much on this track. And then, you know, eventually ended up becoming, weirdly, a fundraiser for Harvard University. I did not go to Harvard, but <laughs> they were like, it doesn't matter. You know, you, you like, you, you, you understand the design, you know, you understand education and, you know, you have the ability to sell, so therefore you'll be great. And I loved it. It was amazing. And then from that, I ended up uh, falling in love with an Englishman uh, and moving over to London to be with him and got a job working as a uh, basically fundraising corporate sponsorship at the Science Museum, which anybody, I think the list team is here, knows that science is definitely not my forte, which is kind of hilarious <laughs> that I ended up selling that. And then, actually, what was interesting is I thought, well, I love the idea of selling and fundraising, kind of making a case and meeting people and developing relationships, but I'd really like to do this in a much more commercial environment, and I've definitely always loved fashion. I think back to when I was a kid and I'd spend every bit of pocket money on Barbie clothes and my sister would save everything and I'd spend it all and that's kind of how it's always been and continues to be. That's um, why you have that amazing dress. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yes. thank you. Um, but I think what was interesting, so I ended up uh, coming, I did a, an, an interview at Condé Nast in the UK and it was funny because they had said to me, oh, we have a job in display advertising at Vanity Fair and I was like, great. I love magazines, I love Vanity Fair, this is going to be amazing. And I went in, and they just started talking about the internet. And I was like, I don't really know what's happening, because they, and I, they were like, oh, how do you feel about the internet? And I was like, I love it, I, lo I love everything. <laughs> I was just like, yeah, I'm totally all about the internet. So, you know, note to self, just freestyle it sometimes. And hilariously, I, I remember, because the woman who headed up HR at the time, this woman, Susanna Amor, she had said to me, you know what? 
we really like you. You're great. We don't really know what to do with you, so we're going to put you in the web team. And I thought, all right. So it was interesting. They're like, and so it was half contract publishing display and half um, internet advertising. And it was three of us. And it was so interesting because we were literally tucked away in like basically a bathroom next to Tatler. It was actually quite sad. But um, they were a bit like, I don't really know what's happening with this internet thing, but we'll just put it over here in the corner and see how it goes. And um, obviously it's developed a lot. It's a big <laughs> revenue stream. It's really important for the business. Um, but it was, yeah, it was interesting. I remember saying to my dad, showing him, I was like, oh, I'm selling, you know, online display advertising for Vogue.com. And he went, people pay for that? And I was like, yeah, that's really good. He's a doctor, so maybe he wasn't getting it. But so, yeah, so that's the beginning of the journey. So. Okay. Well, it's interesting because as I listen to each one of you, it sounds like you could never have planned it. You know, like, nope. I think that's one of the things that um, I, you know, I try to impress upon young people when I speak to them is that the journey that you end up taking in your career is often the furthest thing from what you could have planned or expected. And so sometimes when, you know, you're sitting in your shoes and you're thinking ahead and you're worried about the future, you are like, what am I going to do? You know, what's my plan? And everyone's asking you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Actually, you might have an idea of what you, might, what you want to be when you grow up, but what you actually end up being when you grow up could be completely different. It's most likely to be different. Mm -hmm. um, and I see that commonality in all mm -hmm. of your stories. Mm -hmm. And when people talk about their careers, looking backwards, they package it very nicely yes. as <laughs> though it's, it yes. was really planned. And then it makes you just feel like, oh my God, I don't have a plan. But actually, no one thought it through. It's just telling the story afterwards is just good comms. Yeah. Well, I think it was it's, it's Steve Jobs, you know, he gave that amazing um, valedictory speech at Stanford and he said, it's always easier to connect the dots mm -hmm. with hindsight, Doris, yeah. right? You can make sense of the path you've taken when you look back, mm -hmm. but when you look ahead, like, you can make a plan, but it's, you know, it's really hard to plan for all the things that might happen, like falling in love mm -hmm. or being given a leather bag mm -hmm. or you know, being introduced to an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that we wanted to spend some time on today is the role of women in the fashion industry. You know, uh, one of the things that the business of fashion that we've spent quite a bit of time thinking about is that the fashion business in many ways is a business that's targeted at women. You know, the, the primary consumer of fashion is women. Even if they're buying men's things for their partners, you know, it's often women buying it for men. But women are underrepresented in leadership positions in our industry. And as you know, young people looking ahead to their careers in fashion, you know, what are your reflections on what it takes to be successful as a woman in fashion? Because you've all found success. But it's challenging. It's challenging managing stereotypes. It's challenging managing biology, because women you know, have babies, and some of you are mothers. Um, and it's challenging managing kind of the expectations that people have for women. So as you've navigated your careers, and you know, we don't have to go in order. I mean, whoever would like to go first. You know, what, are, what are, the, what are the, your thoughts and reflections that you have about being a woman working in fashion? I think mostly it's an advantage, honestly. I've never really <laughs> felt that it's an issue. I think you know, if you're passionate and committed and hardworking and kind of good, then you will find your way. Um, I think there probably are, but I remember always saying in my, and we have mostly women in my um, organisation, I remember saying, doing a panel actually at Goldman Sachs, and it was all about diversity, and um, everyone was saying how they're really, you know, having to over-recruit women at the beginning to end up with the right sort of balance, and it's quite the reverse in my industry, <laughs> in my company. But I, I just think we need to worry about it a bit less, truthfully, and, and perhaps that's naive, because perhaps in my company, in my immediate experience, it's less of an issue, but I think that... Clearly, more women role models will lead to more women working, for sure. I think pipeline is important. I think it's, you know, girls looking after girls. But I just think if we do a good job, mm. we'll get there. We've come a long way in a short period of time. And I, I get a bit antsy, actually, about the mm. forcing of women the whole time. I think that, actually, that's sort of slightly beneath us, in a mm. way. And I often sit on, you know, as we do all do now, with, mm. um, on different boards and so on. And actually, sometimes they'll go around and do the sort of sums of you know how many women and it's after all I'm like you know I want to be here because I'm good not because I'm wearing a skirt mm. not that I am um, so um, I don't know I'm, I'm less worried about yeah, it yeah I it's true and the fashion industry is is perhaps more welcoming than mm -hmm. most in not just women but any kind of um, diversity ethnicity sexual whatever mm -hmm. it's very very welcoming so mm -hmm. we're lucky to be in this industry and it's mm -hmm. true you don't feel it in the same way that say my friends who work in 
um, in law firms, mm. uh, for example. But I do think that you mentioned something, Imran, that women drop off as people go up the career ladder. And that, I do think, is a problem because mm -hmm. there's something there. And for me, I, I, it's such a shame because there's such a, um, an investment in talent mm -hmm. from women who've been to university, who've invested in their education, who've learned a lot, companies, uh, not just one, but the multiple companies they've worked at, who've invested in them. And they get to a point, and it's almost like they hit a wall. So a few of the companies I've worked at, in the sort of more junior levels, it's 50-50, mm -hmm. if not skewed more women, 65, mm -hmm. sort of 35. And then as you start to go up to sort of higher levels, it is true that women drop off. And I, mm -hmm. and I think it's to do with that moment in time, biology, mm -hmm. potentially one of the reasons, it's not just one, but mm -hmm. where women just feel like it makes more sense to stop than to carry on. Um, and, and it's hard. It, it's hard. I, I'm in the middle of it. Um, and biology happened to you biology, yeah. biology for the third time. Yeah. Just happened. I have uh, I have three was. little three little ones, and this is the hardest time. They're five, three, and eight weeks, and and this yeah. is the hard bit. And and you, I'm I'm very lucky that I have the ability to um, pay for childcare, etc. But that shouldn't be the reason that women are able to continue. So I think if we can fix that three to five year window, I think there's that. And I think there's also women and their confidence to Anya's point. If that's the window that we can encourage and motivate women to, to keep going and not to feel that, well, it's maybe not worth the investment or maybe this is just too much effort. So, so if we could focus on that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting because at List, it's a, a predominantly uh, younger workforce. So I would say almost everyone in my team is early 20s, early 30s. And it's, it's interesting because I'd never really thought about it that much. I'm just like kind of getting on with it. But I did have a really striking moment about a year ago where someone had said to me in the business, you know what, until I met you, I didn't know that um, you could be a mom and work. And I thought, <laughs> what has happened? You know, this is like 2016. It really... Um, it quite, it struck me, and, and I remember sort of being inspired by that and sort of having a, a, a meeting with the team and saying, you know, you guys, no one's going to hand you something. You have to really get out there and be confident and ask for it. You know, no one in the world gives you anything, and it's not sort of a female-male thing. It's just a person thing, and it was really interesting because they all got galvanized, like, well, I really want you. <laughs> it was quite right before review time, too, which was probably bad time. I was like, well, <laughs> I was like, oh, no. But it was really great because I, I think work for yeah, yeah. Yes. it was really yeah, interesting funny. because it really I think there was there there is a moment I think particularly maybe and I'm just maybe with my own experience with with younger people who are maybe it's first or second job of being a little bit worried about asking or you know being maybe seen as I don't know maybe too aggressive or am I you know there is I think a cultural element of not wanting to rock the boat and wanting to make everybody happy but in the same vein you know, it's like that quote I often think about where if men look at a job description and they see four things they can't do and one thing they can do, they're like, oh, yeah, that's fine. I can totally do all of it. Whereas women just focus on the one thing they can't do and they don't try. Yeah. And I just feel, you know, and I've got a daughter. And, you know, it's really it's some of those yeah. things that I think maybe didn't come into my horizon before, but now I'm, I'm seeing it more. And it's I feel a big responsibility, you know, about being an example. Because what do they say? They say you can't be what you can't see. And yeah. if you're not out there doing things, then mm -hmm. no one knows yeah. that it's an option. Well, it's interesting because mm -hmm. um, Stephanie and Jenny, the, the things that you've just said are borne out by the data yeah. So and mm -hmm. the research. And the, the data says, uh, and we've looked at the data for a long time at BOF, the data says that if you look at the CEOs of the top fashion companies in the world, if you look at the creative directors of the top fashion companies in the world, women are grossly underrepresented. Mm -hmm. Anya, you're the exception. Mm -hmm. And the research also says that women are shown to be less assertive, less confident. They're less willing to say and ask for what they want in order to be successful and grow. And so we do need to create environments where mm -hmm. biology can happen, we can support women and have them progress and understand that you know you can you can do both mm -hmm. you know and mm -hmm. the, the system seems even in fashion which is which is I think the point I was trying to make with even an industry that's focused on women that's like 80% of the employees in fashion are women but as you get to the top that really shifts and mm -hmm. it's quite surprising as someone said to me in a meeting once that old white men are deciding 
what an ad campaign for makeup should be. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's that's the reality of it right now. So it's just something that I thought was worth discussing. I don't know, Caroline, if you have anything to no, add. No, I mean, I think all of these points are, are extremely valid and, and exactly what I would say. I think, um, you know, coming from a consulting background and it was an extremely male-dominated um, environment and I think that's when I learned that I had to start asking more. And I think as an entrepreneur, um, you know, I, and I think all of us, want to try to create environments where you are as encouraging as possible to any individual who is a hard-working individual, whatever lifestyle choices that they decide, whether they want children or don't want children. But um, it, is, it is a weird Thing to have to hear that our um, most open industry is still underrepresented. But yeah, I'm kind of with Anya where if you just work really, really hard, you know, you will rise to the top yeah. and depending on what you want to do, you know. Yeah. So I think actually I, I have a lot of quite feminine male friends. I have a lot of quite male girlfriends. There's such a sort of, I think gender is such a different thing these days anyway mm -hmm. that I, I think it's really in a short space of time it's going to change Tr tremendously. Mm. I think it it's will, really yeah. happening. Mm -hmm. It is really um, yeah. changing. Which is a perfect segue to my next <laughs> question, which <clears throat> is actually that, you know, I can't recall a time in my short 10-year period of working in fashion of there being so much change happening simultaneously. And, you know, a lot of smart people say that when there's a lot of change, there's a lot of opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I thought perhaps it might be interesting to talk to you all about, given this environment of you know, instant fashion and see now, buy now, and the rise of technology and globalization and Brexit and like, you know, an interesting president in the United States and like the world in <laughs> turmoil, and there's so much change happening in the world. Mm. What opportunities do you see for young people mm. in this kind of environment? Like where should they be focusing their attention, right? Where should they be looking for the jobs of the future, like what do you, where, what are the kinds of talents that you have a hard time finding, given that all this change is happening? Ooh, who wants to start well, with that one? We we can't <laughs> hire engineers yep. fast enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, I would say, and and it doesn't. Um, oftentimes, people think, oh, to be a coder and engineer, you have to be absolutely scientific, etc. It's actually very creative. So people can go into it. So that will guarantee you a job for sure. But I think the other thing to sort of come out of this is that the fashion industry has so many different jobs. It's not just, we were talking about this mm -hmm. earlier, it's not just being a designer or a buyer or a, um, a, a sort of marketer. There, there's so many in, and the rise of the internet has opened up a whole new spectrum of jobs that mm -hmm. didn't exist even five years ago. Um, from visual merchandising online to um, uh, sort of UX design, um, graphic design, but online, built for mobile. I mean, there's, there's a huge mm -hmm. number, and, uh, and they're very in demand because that industry is growing. So those are sort of guaranteed ways to bag a job. Um, and is, they don't require yeah. a full degree in uh, university. Yeah. You can really transition yeah. into it. There's, there's some great sort of uh, future um, uh, learning courses. Um, Imran, I think you list a few on... That, that can really train you in eight weeks, so. What I think is interesting on the flip side to that, while it's true that I think engineers, programmers, you know, coders, from a content creating perspective, I think the industry is changing so fast, but actually what will remain at the core is sort of substance yeah. and quality. And I think, you know, I actually sometimes can't find enough quality writers. Yeah. People who can write more than 140 characters. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so it's interesting in the sense that there's, there is a huge array of really interesting new jobs out there. You know, um, but at the same time, I think it's really important to remember that actually, you know, all of you, whoever's studying here in these kind of hallowed halls, also should remember that there is the traditional stuff that you still need to excel at yeah. in order to survive. I don't yeah. think my business would be around if we didn't have sort of fantastic, substantial, qualitative writers. And image makers. And image makers, Because, absolutely. you know, we live in the era, mm. you know, social media is mm. about imagery. Mm. Mm. And so that's one of the things that I think hasn't changed in fashion, is mm. like we might be looking at less images on pages mm -hmm. than we used to, but we're, we're looking at more images than we've than ever looked ever. at before. Yeah. 
I would argue actually that fashion actually hasn't changed fast enough, mm. funny enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, you look, yeah. at, you look at music and what Apple did for music and how we've completely changed mm. our buying habits, the way we stream things, the way we share, and that we might have now libraries you pay subscriptions to. I mean, it's radically changed the model. And I mean, BOF did that so brilliantly. Um, but actually, I think fashion is frankly quite old fashioned in some mm -hmm. respects. Yeah. Um, so I think frankly, it needs a bit of a kick up the bum, actually. <laughs> and a bit of different thinking is really exciting. And, um, <coughs> and we'll make it more appropriate. But I would also say to the point of, of sort of jobs and that actually I think, and I look at my kids now, that you know, before you wanted to get a kind of a career and you were nervous perhaps to quit um, mm. a good job. I had a child who's a lawyer and one who's a management consultant. And, and actually I think they both realized that actually they could quit and start something or try something. And actually you're still very employable after that. So it was less risky mm. actually. Um, and I think that's a really exciting thing. Because I think you know, before it'd be nervous, you'd be nervous to sort of jump off the train, and now you can, and um, and you're almost more employable as a result. So that's quite an exciting movement, mm. I think. But I also think technology will be at the core of everything because it's funny. I listened to a quote the other day from a woman that runs Tech City, and she said it won't be about tech jobs because jobs are tech. Mm. It's yeah. not even a word. It's yeah. a bit like e-commerce and commerce. It's mm. or digital. It's just silly. I mean, I think at the end of the day. You know, because my son said to me the other day, I don't know if I'm going to be, you know, a DJ or a YouTuber. And I was like, what? Like, <laughs> dare to dream. But it was, um, I mean, it's great, but um, it a YouTuber. <laughs> he does have a YouTube channel, but I'm not going to plug it here. But, um, but it's really interesting because if I think even in my own role, in the last two and a half years at List, when I first started talking to partners, you know, it was mostly, you know, uh, brand managers or head of e-commerce, and now it's head of performance marketing. It's like, mm. okay, what's my SEO going to be like? And mm. when you talk about content, you know, for our team, a lot of the writers, it's not just about the traditional route of mm. like, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to be in a magazine or be on an amazing site. It's like things that actually impact a business in terms of, you know, SEO, you know, performance, all these other things. And it's, as you mentioned, Imran, <coughs> data. It's all about the data, and that will not go away. That will just get even more complex and even more important. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's interesting because I think what I hear you saying is that we need the traditional roles in fashion, but you also need the flexibility to, to adapt to this new environment. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that, that I see happening is that basically like new jobs that didn't exist five years ago all, all of a sudden exist. Yep. So you don't even know you know, what the job might be that is the best fit for you, because it might not even exist yet, mm -hmm. right? But how so, amazing is that? Yeah, That's so yeah. Exciting. it's super it's exciting, yeah. and I think, I think it requires a certain level of openness yeah. to change, yeah. and a certain, a certain level of, mm -hmm. like, curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, so when people talk about, you know, performance marketing, mm -hmm. you know, which is basically like data, data, mm -hmm. data, data, mm -hmm. those jobs, you know, those, they couldn't measure the performance mm -hmm. of an an ad page in Vogue before, yeah. it was just a guess. Yeah. But now people want to have more understanding of mm -hmm. how their, their ad budgets are performing. Mm -hmm. But actually, to an early point you made as well, actually, I think you have to just follow your nose a bit. And I think that, you know, you might start off, you said it earlier, start off with an idea that I want to do this, but things come of things. I remember my father always said to me, you know, if you do something, something happens. And actually, if you, as you were saying, if you look at your career, if you sort of work backwards and think, if I hadn't done that, that wouldn't have happened. Yeah. And, and actually, you just have to kind of follow the opportunity and not yeah. be scared to, mm -hmm. to morph into something different. It's really important to be mm -hmm. open, yeah. I think. Yeah, opportunistic and, and make sure that you're not... Uh, my mother actually says, make sure you're not so focused that you don't see what's mm -hmm. coming mm -hmm. from uh, stage left and stage right. Um, and it's true, and particularly in this fast-moving environment where companies are popping up, disrupting, um, you never know. You might start in a small company and end up being the next unicorn. Mm -hmm. Um, so now a slightly different question, which is, you know, you're all building teams. You know, Jenny's building a team at List, Stephanie's building a team at Farfetch, and you've built teams. Anya's been building a team for her and her, you know, <laughs> and, and, and Caroline as well. I mean, a more general question is, is what do you, in this environment where everything's changing and new jobs are being invented and new technologies are popping up, like, you know, Snapchat didn't exist, whatever, three years ago or four years. <clears throat> what do you look for when you're interviewing someone? And I assume that by the time someone gets to meet you, Caroline, or you, Anya, they've met a couple of other people. What are you looking for when you're hiring people? What are the qualities and characteristics that you look for mm. in, in people? 
I mean, I look for curiosity. That's sort of, um, if I can figure out whether they're extremely curious, then I know that that's a really big tick. Um, Why? Exactly, I think what, what all of, of, of us have been saying, I think people have to be incredibly flexible, but they also have to be incredibly curious about what's happening in the world, the greater world, more than just your job and the role that is being presented to you, and how things fit together and how, you know, I think the most successful people I've ever met are the most curious people. And um, for me, in the business of trying to be, um, you know, a leader in, in content and message and, and things that are happening, you have to be curious. Um, and it's hard to find, figure that out. But I think, you know, the way that I ask is kind of try to understand their bigger world picture and the things that drive them and the things that make them curious and, and try to get a good picture for that. I always want to find someone I want to work with. You know, it sounds quite kind of trite, but you sort of want to yeah, time people. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, I think it's a natural, um, a natural sort of vetting system in the sense that it means you're, you're aligned with their views. You know, it's actually, it saves a lot of words in, in a way. So that's amongst obviously lots of other, clearly they need to have some experience in the role and blah, 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 but that's a really important thing for me. I want to like them, actually, or admire them. Mm. Yeah. Um, I mean, to add to those, um, so I'll be quite old school here. Um, be prepared. It, it, it's <laughs> unbelievable. Um, oh, God, the number of interviews I have yeah. where the person hasn't fully prepared about the business, the, and there's no excuse. There is so much information. I mean, you can Google it on the way there in the Uber. Um, so just someone who's taken the time to prepare, to understand, to understand the requirements, to, um, and I think there's a little bit, and here's the old school, there's a little bit, there's still, I'm interviewing them. Um, yes, the bit about them interviewing the business is, absolutely crucial and important, but let's remember that <laughs> True. You're, you're looking for a job here. Mm. So being prepared, understanding the business, and then you know asking questions, being a lateral thinker, all of that. But I think it's quite basic. It's not a difficult one, but um, I, I see a lot of people sort of n not do that, and it, and it surprises me often. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, when I started at List, I had never worked in a startup before. You know, I had gone from Condé Nast to net porte to List, 50 people. It's now 150. And I had to take a team of from 1 to 13 in about six months and figure out what the heck I was doing at the same time. So for me, it was very easy Seems to like tell. Seems like a general pattern. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's, it, is, it kind of is, actually, I think. But um, it's... So it was interesting. There were kind of three things, and I was actually talking to Chris, our founder, the other day about this, and he said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal that for myself. And I said, there are three, three requirements to be successful, I think, for us in the business. One is you have to be super passionate because you're going to work really hard, and you have to really love it because you're going to be there all the time, and it's going to be your whole life. You'll appreciate this as someone who's been doing the same. Um, secondly, you have to be really smart. We have you know, 75 data scientists and engineers, 10 PhDs. You really have to be able to keep up. And I think the third piece is, as you mentioned earlier, Imran, adaptability. Because your job that you have now will completely change in the next six months because the whole business will be changing. And it's actually remained true and constant in the last two and a half years that I've been there. And, and you know, actually, no one had left the team. So I was quite happy about that, yeah. that we made the right choice. So, um, so yeah, I think, I think those three things. And, and then you're kind of, you're golden, you're all set. What should you not do? So, you know, there's this really interesting relationship that, people of our generation <laughs> have with people of your generation. <laughs> the millennials, the Gen Z, this whole thing. And there's been a lot of discussion in the media about you know, the, the behaviors of a new generation. And some of them, I think, are actually quite good. Yeah. right? But what are the things that you think block people from being successful? Arrogance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How does that manifest itself, though? Well, I think actually your point about in an interview situation, actually, um, as you say, you want someone to be prepared and not have spelling mistakes on a CV, for example. Um, but, but actually also the point when you, know, you want to ask any other questions, actually you, you want, it to, you want to, an element of, of being keen, being curious, and, and being humble, and being... There can be an element of arrogance, but not often, but that can happen. Mm -hmm. so I think that's important to note. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Stephanie? 
I think um, it's not it's not a negative quality, but I think it can be a bit of a blocker. Um, is perhaps impatience. And look, we've all been there. I, I'm extremely impatient in my. Is the sense that if I don't progress, if I don't get promoted, if I don't do the next thing, then where am I going? Um, you know, I, I've had situations where. I've hired someone and within two weeks, can I have a review, please? And what's my career development? Mm -hmm. and, and I'm thinking, well, hey, you've been here two weeks. Um, and mm -hmm. it, it's a good thing. You want a certain amount of it, but it can also mean that you don't actually spend the time to really understand and learn the role and, and, and the different elements. And if you think you've got a, a role nailed in two weeks, then you're really not, you're, you're sort of learning things at this level and not going further down. I think it's the kind of, you know, Instagram generation. I was saying I can't read long form anymore because we're so ADD. But I think there's a time to be like that and there's a time to just be able to be a bit deeper. And so probably a, a form of impatience. There's a balance mm -hmm. um, there. Yeah, but I think I think in a way we need to be adaptable too. So no, no, no. It's it's interesting because I think we need to be adaptable too because I think you have to remember and I think about this a lot because I often think no one gave me a course on how to manage millennials and I really wish I had one. But ultimately, <laughs> I wish I had one. Too. I'm learning <laughs> so much because ultimately it's changing, right? And so I need to change. Yeah. That's how it works. Yeah. And and I have found I have learned so much from everyone in my team. They're all amazing, and I'm so 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 lucky. But I think. You know, you have to remember this is an environment where you're looking. It, I don't want to say like us and them, but you look and you they see Mark Zuckerberg done, and they think that's the route. Like that's how it works. I'm gonna work like a couple years and do this amazing startup and be a zillionaire, and that's that's it. And I'm like, mm, I don't know. I mean, everybody has a different path, but I think the interesting thing for me, you know, what not to do is maybe don't ask for something until you've actually proven the worth for getting it, if that makes Earned sense. It. Yeah. Earned it. But I also don't think we should be old school, like, well, here's how it works, and you have to do that. There are no rules, I think, anymore, yeah. honestly. Yeah. And I think if someone, I've been really lucky, like people on my team, they're kind of, like, they ask for more, they want to learn more, they're hungry, they really want to be part of something mm -hmm. and really believe in it, and mm -hmm. I love that, and because that's why they work so hard, but I think ultimately, What's interesting is don't ask for more until you've already done what you needed to be there to do. So like a lot of times people are like, I want more of a challenge, I want to learn more, but you still need to do the main job. Mm -hmm. And I think ultimately um, what's great is that what, you've, what I have found in my experience is that you get people who will do the job but then ask for more and be hungry, hungry, hungry to get more and more done. And that I don't think ever happened within my peer group. People mm -hmm. were always just like... You know, I would say there's just a lot more uh, passion, mm. at least in in the teams that I've seen. Mm. Caroline, any bugbears? I mean, gosh, all of them have kind of touched upon all of mine, really. I think while there's so much opportunity for all of you and there's so many different jobs to apply for, at the same time, I think, you know, you should really focus your time on things that you're actually could be passionate about. You know, I'm a big believer you don't need the experience, but you need the passion. And, you know, usually you won't get past a very quick, you know, far point through the process because it's very easy to, to weed out the people who are sort of, this is what I do, you know, you'd be lucky to have me. And, and you're kind of like, but don't you want to know anything about what you could be doing and, and the business? And, you know, so I think definitely, you know, focus your time on things that you know your environments you think are going to be passionate to be in, roles and, um, and brands. Yeah, those are all really good bits of advice um, on what not to do. Just before I open it up to questions from uh, the audience here, uh, I have one last question, which is like, what's the best piece of advice anyone ever gave you? And if you could share that piece of advice with this group here, uh, I think that could be really helpful. I'll start. I read a book called Feel, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. <clears throat> And I have... Um, feel the fear. Feel the fear and do it anyway. Okay. And I think I've lived my career to do that. I think I've said yes to things that I have felt sort of, oh, God, I have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah. But it's worked out. And I think you should all feel a little bit of fear and then just push through it and, and move on. And that's actually, you know, that, those are the moments when you actually do earn mm. the next level. Those are the moments when you do learn the most. Yeah, absolutely. Those are the moments when you just, you might be freaking out, but you realize that you had a skill or yeah. a potential that you didn't know you had. Yeah. If, it, if everything that you're 
you're asked to do feels like a piece of cake, yeah. then you're not being challenged yeah, enough. Yeah, you're not learning anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anya? That's the same point, but I have a, a sign in my office, a benign sign, graffiti sign, and it's the word scary. <laughs> Someone once said to me that actually fear is the same emotion as excitement, and I think it's mm -hmm. very important to, to... And I think absolutely you push yourself, and actually you realise you can do it, and you just get to the next barrier, and you keep pushing yourself. But also there's a lovely Oscar Wilde quote, which is, um, be yourself, the other places are taken. <laughs> and I think mm -hmm. that's very good, actually, in a creative world, to you just play the music, don't listen to the critics, mm -hmm. and actually do what you do and stay true to what you believe. I think that's really important. But, you know, things come of things, fake it to make it. I mean, I've gone all night. You know? <laughs> there are so many <laughs> quotes in this room. Stephanie, the well, best so piece of advice you've ever had. Well, there, there are lots, but, uh, yeah, just a, a silly line, but I think it says a lot is fake it till you make it. So mm -hmm. it's, it's silly, but if you look into it a little bit, it's, you know, so much is about how you present to the world, so much is about just thinking and having the confidence to do it. Some of it is just do it. Um, and um, if you say it enough, it happens. So there's that visualization and that sort of positioning yourself. So I think that line, as silly as it sounds, carries a lot um, in it. And uh, yeah, that's it. I saw this great quote uh, recently, which was, I don't care where I'm going as long as I'm going forward. And it was like David Livingston's <laughs> Explorer. And I thought, that's great, because that's absolutely it. And I think, you know, to your point, to your point, uh, Caroline and Anya, it was before I was moving from Boston to move to London uh, to be with my now husband, I remember being like, oh my God, what am I going to do? This is crazy, moving country, moving jobs, moving life. And my boss at the time at Harvard, this really kind of like battle axe lady, <laughs> had said to me, um, you know what, if you're terrified, it's the right thing to do. <laughs> I have always thought of her, and it's always true. Every job I've ever thought, I'm like, I'm a little bit freaked out, but you just do it, and it's never been the wrong decision. Yeah. Absolutely embrace that fear. Mm -hmm. And remember that you can only take one step at a time. I mean, no one just achieves something by, no one, no one, not a business, not a, not a super person, no one. It's, they even, all Mark take, even Mark Zuckerberg. Even Mark Zuckerberg. Even Mark Zuckerberg. Um, yeah. Someone said, um, Farfetch did, um, did an event just last week, and, um, and one of the panelists was the CEO of Deliveroo, and he repeated it over and over again. He said, all these amazing businesses that you see that you think they've popped out of nowhere, Uber, Deliveroo, et cetera, they've taken seven, eight, nine years of gestation and hard work, et cetera. And I think it's the same um, with, with your career, with the job. It, it doesn't just happen. You just take one step at a time. And one step is easy, and the second step is quite easy, and that third one. So if you just break it down, it makes it all the more sort of doable. Yeah. And work hard. And be nice to people. Work hard and be nice. Work hard and be nice. It nice. pays it's off in spades. <laughs> Kindness um, is everything. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, just to kind of close off that discussion, I think you know, people talk about overnight success, right? Yeah. And especially in the media. I have yet to meet one mm -hmm. very successful person who will say that they were successful overnight. Mm. You, you have overnight discovery. <laughs> yeah, maybe. You have overnight discovery of that person. But you know, every person's career journey and life journey is a journey. And it takes time. It takes time discovering who you are, you know, following your nose, being true to yourself, working hard, being nice to people, being flexible, all of those things. Mm -hmm. And that all takes time. It all takes time. OK, so now um, I'm going to turn over the uh, questions to all of you, because I'm sure you have even better questions uh, than I was able to put together with my team. So if you want to raise your hand, please introduce yourself. We have microphones, um, two sets of microphones. Do me a favor and don't give a lecture. <laughs> ask a question because that's going to that's going to give more time for other people to ask questions. So introduce yourself briefly and please ask a question that's to the point. Um, so I saw a hand right there near the camera go up first. Why don't we start there? Can you please stand up as well? Thank you. Hello. Um, hi, my name's Tara. Nice to meet you all. Um, my question was, um, for all of you guys, before you landed that first big job, um, have you dealt with rejection and how did you deal with it? But also further down the line, how did you also deal with that rejection from maybe perhaps further jobs, if that's ever happened? Really good question. So how did you deal with rejection or failure, I guess? I think rejection, I always think it's a bit like, and I mean, I 
I only ever work for myself, but you know, you're dealing with buyers or you're dealing with projects, whatever it might be. And I think that actually any journey is a bit like sailing, and I don't sail, so <laughs> just guessing. <laughs> <laughs> I love where this is going, yes. to be honest. But, but when you sail, apparently, you tack a bit left, you tack a bit right, you tack a bit left, and you get to your journey, but it's lots and lots of bits of failure. Hmm. Yeah. Or lots and lots of wins. And I think yeah. you have to learn to deal with that and to stomach it and not worry about it. Yeah. So it's really important just to know that everyone yeah. goes through that. And actually, when you write the story and you create your beautifully packaged career <laughs> after the fact, those end up being some of the best moments, mm -hmm. the best... Um, I was just remembering something today, actually. I did interview at a management consultancy, and uh, Imran and Karen, and you'll know <laughs> this, uh, they gave me a case study, and I totally screwed it up. I didn't even know how to do a case study. There, there are ways to do it. I should have prepped. There we are. Um, lessons learned. I can, and the guy who interviewed me was really, um, he said, well, you know, m maybe a job in strategy is not for you. You should think about something else. And it really hit me at the time. And then you fast forward 15 years, I run strategy for mm. a um, internet business, uh, a big one. Um, you know, maybe you never I know how it. it's going to work never know. out. <laughs> but, yes. but I would have never ended up in New York at a PR agency. I wouldn't have started in fact. So, and he was really mean. Um, so but, be kind. Yeah. yeah, be kind as well. And yes. give, give good feedback. And if you reject anyone for an interview, for um, even people who call on the phone and hassle you, you know, the cold callers, be nice. You never know. It's also not the end of the story, is it? Because no. I, I think we could spend a whole hour on the jobs that I applied for and didn't get. And so cringy when I think, I, maybe afterwards I'll tell you offline, but because um, they're pretty embarrassing. But I think ultimately the key thing is you live through it. You think it's the end of the world. You know, you think mm. there's this master plan. And, and I think the key piece of advice I would give is, it's meant to be, you know? If you didn't get it, then you're meant to, it's, it's opening your mind up to the next opportunity, which will be the right one. Okay, next question. Um, just in the front here, and can we have the next microphone go to the young woman over there? So the first microphone's gonna go here, and just so we can get more questions, we're gonna have two microphones so I can just swap. Okay, just over, yeah. And there's one in the front here. Nope. All right, maybe we don't have two microphones. <laughs> All right, we'll start, with, we'll start with you. Do we have a second microphone? Yeah, it's just traveling down Okay. There. Um, yeah, so just make sure when you're done with the microphone. So we'll start with you, and then we'll go to you, and then I will find two more people right away. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Asma, and it's so beautiful to actually listen to all of you, so thank you so much for this. My question actually goes to all of you. What's the one question that you wish people asked you more in the industry? So it could be your staff, or you could be like young people that have actually met you. What's that one thing that you wish people do ask you more? What's the one question you wish people would ask you? Um, Maybe in a job interview setting. Everyone's asked all the like good battle. questions. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, no, good, good mm. question. Um, Don't you think it's, you know, how can I really make a difference? What would it take to really make yeah. a difference to this yeah. role? Yeah. It's um, always a good question, mm. that one. Um, uh, yeah. And you know what I wish people on my team would ask me? What could I have done better? Yeah. Mm. You know, like, you, everyone can do better. Mm. We can all do better. Mm. Yeah. But, like... What's the one thing that you, you know, even if you've had a great success, you always want to figure out a way of being better, mm -hmm. right? Because you can be sure that everyone else mm -hmm. around you is trying to be better. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what can I do better? It's a great feedback. way of, you know, sometimes, I don't know, I feel like I don't give enough feedback. Mm -hmm. It opens up the yeah, conversation. Yeah, it opens yeah. up yeah. a conversation mm -hmm. that we all need more feedback. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, next question was in the middle over here. Hi, um, my name is Christina. I'm actually doing my MA in journalism at Central St. Martins, and thank you guys so much. Um, I did politics before at McGill, so for me, fashion and politics <laughs> are intertwined. So in the current state of the world in a bit of a flux, do you think that fashion responds to politics enough? Is it superficial? What can we do better? What is the current state for especially the British companies with the Brexit and everything happening? 
Yeah. Yeah, we have Brexit, we have a snap election, we have <laughs> chaos <laughs> in Westminster. Nuclear. <laughs> it's terrifying. What's 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 you know what's fashion's relationship with politics yeah. and could it be more substantive? I mean, that's a that's a big question. I think um, you know, fashion as as an industry is an incredibly powerful industry, right? It's an it's a job provider for so many of us, all of us here in this room, uh, ultimately. And I think, you know, there are bits of the industry that are very politically engaged or aware. Um, I think more and more, I think sustainability comes into play as well. I think um, each and every one of us, every brand, every business, we all approach it in a very, very different way. I know from the point of view from Tank, we are very, very politically engaged. But I think fashion is, you know, should never be thought of as superficial. I think just because we buy new bags, shoes, love to buy a new outfit, you know, I think that um, we celebrate craftsmanship and um, beauty and product. And I think we celebrate people's hard work that go into those products. Um, and I think it's very dangerous to dismiss fashion as being very superficial. And I think... Um, all but could us. we do more, Anya, as an industry? No, actually, I think we're growing exponentially. I mean, if you look at the, the numbers, it's huge, the fashion, fashion industry, as a contributor to GDP in the UK. It's absolutely phenomenal. It's an incredibly diverse employer. It's um, really a, a superstar, actually, if you look at all the different industries in, in, in the UK um, in terms of contribution. So I think that we should actually speak up for it more mm. and be less embarrassed about the fact that people do consider it to be frivolous. It's not. It's, it's really important, actually. And then I think that generally also, of course, on the flip side, no one needs another handbag or another pair of trousers. We all have enough clothes to keep us dry and warm and, and safe. But the fact is, what does it do? It makes us happy. Mm. It makes us feel more confident. The difference that I feel in wearing something that I feel really good in uh, and how it makes me present myself and speak and look people and give eye contact is a really valuable thing. In fact, there's an amazing charity called Dress for Success oh, where, mm, where they actually outfit people before an interview um, and the difference is, is amazing. So it's a, it's a really interesting subject. It's much deeper than just a frivolous thing. I think it's actually a, a lot about identity and about confidence. And, um, and I think it's actually quite an interesting subject as well. So I think we should shout up, shout up for it a bit more. And I think actually find up at a rather unstable moment um, with so much going on. It's never been more important, I would say. Um, so I think it's an interesting time for fashion. It's a global industry. And I think as, um, as what we're seeing is that... Uh, People, countries, they're retrenching, becoming more nationalistic, more closed, more perhaps um, isolationist. Um, fashion is a global, um, and actually what social media has shown and Instagram is that you've got all these tribes of people that cross borders. Um, and that's a really wonderful thing, and social media has, has allowed for that. So I think that's, that's why we should <coughs> celebrate it, because it really crosses borders, nationalities, ethnicities, etc. Fashion is quite a unifier. Um, and it allows people to be themselves. And I think, to, to, to both of your points, I think, Imran, you've done an unbelievable job at raising the profile of fashion, not just mm -hmm. what people see on the outside, but the fact that it's a big business. Mm -hmm. So um, it's the business of fashion. We should be very, very um, proud to work in an industry that employs so many people. Yeah. But Just on that, I, yeah, yeah, and I think on that political note, though, I think, for example, your Tied Together campaign, you know, on a... Personal level, as a human being, as in an industry that yes is both commercially very important and and you know in, significant. It's also very important to think it's about welcome, welcomeness and openness, and that everybody. I mean, I always say this to my kids. You know, we're all in this together, and I and I think there is a little bit more to do. I think probably the challenge right now for the entire retail industry is that it's got a lot of challenges itself, and then to sort of add on another layer of complexity is just it's it's. It's a very hard time, I think, to be a retailer in the world right now. And I think, yeah. you know, it's hard when the, the old rules that you knew and were tried and true for the last 30 years have completely transformed. It's a bit like, to your point, on you about music. It's like people need to kind of see that things are moving. So I think there is more to be done. I think there are initiatives like yours that are helping to move that forward. But I think there's just people don't really know where to start sometimes because they've got so much going on in the mm -hmm. day to day. But Okay. We have time for two more questions. Mm -hmm. So why don't we take this question in the front here and the question in the back corner over there. 
Hi there, um, I'm Yasmin and I study international relations and history at the LSE, um, but I'm really interested in fashion, so hearing your journeys about how you've got into fashion is really, really inspiring. Um, but I was just wondering how important an internship is for someone who doesn't have a fashion background to go into fashion later. Interesting question. Caroline? I think it's incredibly valuable. I think if you can spend that time getting to just understand a bit of that industry, I think it's, it's, it's really, truly invaluable. Absolutely. I, I couldn't recommend it more. It's also quite good for you, because actually if it's an industry you don't know, perhaps, actually you might say you don't like it. <laughs> I and mean, I think internships are as much about you know, getting a leg up mm. as they are actually thinking, do I want to actually commit to this? So I think it's really good. Um, and I think wherever you can, you know, the more you learn. You, you learn by stepping into an office. Even for half an hour, I think you learn so much. So the more you can do that, the better. Yeah, and that's a place. An internship is, is one where ask, ask, what can I do? How can I help? What can I do more of? What, um, and, and it should be paid. I think it's, le it's illegal yeah, it's now legal, to yeah. internships that are unpaid. But just even a small amount, because no one should work unpaid. And I've hired three interns to full-time positions in my mm -hmm. time. So yeah. it's definitely yeah. worthwhile yeah, because is, yeah. you're testing both sides yeah, for sure. Yeah. You can hire from mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Okay, one more question, which I think is in the back over there. Hi, my name is Samantha Edelstein and I'm doing my foundation here at Central St. Martins. Um, my question, I know it doesn't really apply to you because you haven't gone to specific fashion schools, but I was wondering now when you're like hiring for internships, how important do you think it is to have gone to a good fashion school? Because at least with my generation here, I feel like there's a lot of peer pressure in saying you've gone to a really good fashion school, but actually sometimes that doesn't measure your abilities. So I wanted to know what you think about that. Well, I can say in hiring designers um, and, um, and creatives, or any role actually, um, of course it's great and it helps, but actually in a creative sense, it's a portfolio that would swing it for me over, over the name on, on, of a fashion school. Um, so it's really about your work um, clearly, if you can have great work and have gone to a great college as well, that's probably better. But I think the work is the most important thing. Um, so I wouldn't worry. You know, I think you know if you can, fab, but it doesn't doesn't close doors for sure. I think what great great names do is give a great network and an alumni network that you can really tap into, um, and that gets you in the door. But then it's about work and uh, how you then follow through that really matters at the end of the day. And with that, I'm sorry that we have to close. Clearly there were a lot more questions. The good news is this isn't the last event of its kind. We will do more of these events in partnership with Topshop this year. Uh, the next one will take place in New York City, so you can all follow it uh, on Facebook. <laughs> for those of you who are watching on Facebook, thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope that you've took, taken away some lessons and some inspiration. I've certainly been inspired by these women, so please help me in thanking them. <laughs> I'd also specifically like to thank Central St. Martins and the, the team here, uh, the Central St. Martins staff for hosting us and helping to make this event possible. I want to thank our partners at Topshop who have been really great partners for us in making events like this happen. Uh, they're also underwriting all of your BOF professional memberships. So if you are full-time, how many people have a BOF professional membership because of Topshop? Amazing. Wow. Those of you who don't, you get a free subscription to BOF, all courtesy of Topshop, and that will give you all the intelligence and information and analysis you need, analysis you need to prepare for a career in fashion. And for those of you who are interested, we're offering a very special discount on BOF education courses, which is online learning to prepare for your career in fashion too. So if you want that discount, make sure you leave your email um, with our team on the way out. And I'd also finally like to thank the BOF team uh, who always work very, very hard to make all of these things happen. I just get to show up and sit in the chair, <laughs> but they organize everything. So thank you to the team as well. And thanks for coming.